Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway, and it is an exciting day, as it always is every year in college football. This is because it's National Signing Day, at least the early one, but this is the one that pretty much everybody uses now. This is this has taken the spot of the later signing period, which used to be the popular one. Now it's, hey, everybody get signed up right now and be good to go. And uh, unless anything changes, all of K-State's high school signees should be wrapped up and taken care of on this national signing day. You won't have to wait until later. And I, I can't remember a time in recent memory where you've had to wait on any of the high school guys to sign later, maybe a, a Juco guy from, you know, here or there, but for the most part, Chris Kleiman and his crew, they've had guys that are wrapped up, ready to go. And uh, last year there really wasn't much sweating out on anybody no. Uh, most of them came in pretty fast and furious early in the day. I remember just waiting on a couple. So uh, I guess we'll just start with that, depending on when anybody uh, is kind of listening to this, because some might be starting their day with it on Wednesday or others might be ending it. So all this is obsolete. But what is the anticipated timeline for K-State in terms of these uh, signings taking place? From the information that I've kind of gathered, it, it sounds like, I mean, we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon, so obviously things can change, but it sounds like everything will be kind of wrapped up pretty early. I think someone told me like potentially closer to like 10 a.m. Everything should be pretty wrapped up. And to be honest, there hasn't been a whole lot of drama. And I, I honestly think that that's a good thing. And it shows that like everybody was pretty bought in and ready to roll. And the only question mark that we really had uh, coming in and it wasn't even this week because it was solved last week was Blake Barnett. And with uh, Colin Klein leaving, there was kind of a question mark of does Blake Barnett continue on with K-State? But as we've kind of saw going forward that there was no real doubts in anybody's mind about Blake Barnett signing with K-State. And I mean, last year, the only real drama, and I, I don't even know how much of this was really drama, but there was a... Uh, Jordan Allen was a little bit later than everybody else. So people were kind of panicked a little bit. And I think it was Taylor Bratt on signing day or a day after made the joke of, yeah, Jordan just like overslept because they didn't, they didn't have school that day. And then um, the other one last year that kind of came down to the wire a little bit was uh, Terry Kirksey. I know it was Indiana, I believe mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. was coming after him pretty hard. And he ended up committing and signing with K-State on signing day. But I mean, it's it's a relatively stress-free signing period again for K-State, which is a good thing because it makes our jobs a lot easier because I know I went ahead and got a lot of my signing day stuff done mm -hmm. between Sunday and Monday because I anticipated everybody to sign. And that that's where, it, I mean, that it just is so much easier for us when, yeah. when there's nothing crazy that happens. So in terms of, you know, thinking about this class and everything else and any surprises, I mean, we're, we're not expecting any surprise high school or JUCO edition late in the day. I mean, last year it was kind of assumed that it was heading this way, but you had a guy like Trey Spivey. He didn't announce his decision until he was signing his letter of intent there, but it, we're, we're, we're good and done and the, the class is locked away, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um... Now that you brought that up, I, I just remembered this, that uh, Trace Spivey actually signed with K-State, and they put it out on the rub site before he actually committed, which was kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, no no anticipated surprises. I mean, we're at, like I said, like we're recording this Tuesday afternoon. Um, Malcolm Alcorn Crowder may or may not sign. If he signs on Wednesday, I'm pretty confident it would be K-State. But, I mean, we're, we're at a wait-and-see period with that as well. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a, like, Wednesday morning commit sign, kind of like Terry Kirksey was last year. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see. And, you know, in terms of everything else, like, we'll we'll just kind of have to monitor, and, and that might be the only one, I guess, that seems like it might, you know, linger a little bit. Now, in terms of this class being easy to kind of digest, well – the thing that's made it easy to kind of prepare for is it's pretty small in terms of what you're looking at for what counts as the class of 2024. K-State only has, uh, I believe, 13 commitments in that right now. That isn't counting the transfers. They're their whole you know, own deal or whatever. Um, 
just for the people that might be confusing, you know, uh, lacking the understanding, because I think most people have a grasp on what went down here because you and DY have done such a nice job of keep, keeping them informed. But why was this such a smaller class for K-State and why should people not panic when they go to the Big 12 rankings and see that K-State, I think, is 11th right now? Uh, so part of that is there just weren't a lot of seniors this year and you see well why do they not add more high school guys later like some other schools do well what k-state does to supplement uh people transferring out is that they bring in transfers coming in so they don't try to backfill guys like rj garcia or jordan wright or players like that transferring by adding another high schooler they added another juco or a transfer portal player to supplement that. So you kind of see that. And that's a little bit why this is a lot smaller of a class. It, it's also probably a good thing that this is a smaller class, because I think if they would have added close to 20 high schoolers, they'd have probably 40 players between redshirt freshmen and true freshmen next year. And that's over half of your team or almost close to half of your team on scholarship. So it's a good way to balance it out because last year, I mean, last year's class was pretty big, especially high school wise. So it's a good thing. And then in terms of ranking, so much of that is kind of skewed by how many players you have. And, and I've said this yeah. before. So like, it's more of like, I think it's better to look at uh, the class average where K state right now is currently seventh. And I anticipate them staying either seventh or potentially even going up because I, I, pointed out that uh Jaquez Bradley Demps has actually gotten a ratings increase on rivals that hasn't um registered yet on the on three industry rankings and I think that if he goes up just a little bit because he's now a 5.63 star on rivals instead of a 5.42 star that I think that that little bit of increase would get K-State into the top five in class average uh in the big 12 which would be a big deal. I mean, yeah. last last year was a historic class for K-State, but if you look at it, and yes, it is skewed a little bit because this class is smaller, but this class's average is actually a, a lot better than last year's. Yeah, that that's, that's a great thing to, to point out to people because ultimately, nationally and, it, you know, big picture view, a lot of people are going to look at the you know, the, the, the overall ranking that is next to the name and it's going to be like, okay, oh, state finished pretty low down there, but you're right. Last year, the average rating in K-State's class was an 85.81. Uh, right now, as it currently stands, it's an 86.65. And keep in mind last year that included Avery Johnson, who was, you know, one of the, the top 200 guys in the country. And this K-State class, they have talent all over the place. I mean, all the different services are un- you know, they're, they're kind of back and forth. Some have one guy higher and others this way. But if you go through and look at what K-State has, Gus Hawkins is now an industry four-star. He's got four stars from both on three and 24-7, which are, you know, easily the top two recruiting services in the country. And so he's a four-star. Then you have a guy like Trey Davis, who he's got four stars on on three and ESPN. Cade Massey has four from 24-7. Um, Blake Barnett has four from Rivals now. Jaquez Bradley Demps has four from on three and Jake Stonebreaker has four from ESPN. So you go down the list here, K-State has six guys on here that one service or another views as a four star. Um, that, that's that's that, pretty good. That's pretty good company to have. And, and that's almost half of your class. Yeah. I mean, and then I believe Malcolm Alcorn Crowder has, um, a four-star ranking on at least one service currently. I'm actually checking that right now. So, if, yeah, he, yeah, he's a, he's a four-star on ESPN. So if Case it ends up uh, landing at Malcolm Alcorn Crowder, you're going to have half of your uh, class of 2024 that isn't the portal players <laughs> have a four-star ranking on at least one service. I mean, it, when's the last time you could say that Case eight has done that well? Because the recruiting services aren't perfect. Like, a uh, I mean, well, I think, on three is, but everybody else. Yeah, you're right. I think if we could go back and if everybody could redo some of the rankings, even from last year's K-State class, they would probably change some. I know Austin Romain and Jace Brown come to mind pretty easily off the top of my head mm -hmm. of guys that like probably were rated too low. But it's nice to see 
the ratings and rankings and the recruiting services kind of catching on to kind of what we've thought all along about this K-State staff, that they can evaluate talent with the best of them. Yeah. They, they've been so early on a lot of highly, highly, highly ranked kids. I mean, we saw Grant Bricks' blow up of then eventually signing with Nebraska, uh, most likely, that they they see and get talent on campus and are the first offer a lot of kids. And I mean, it's good to see that come to fruition with Gus Hawkins because it's like sometimes you do see that rankings are influenced by when you commit and what other Power 5 offers you have. And mm-hmm. it's good to see that Gus Hawkins, who was K-State's first commit, that everybody still can't kind of went and evaluated him further and further because Gus Hawkins just rose throughout the season on all four recruiting services and ended up being an industry four star. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's that's such a huge deal, especially when you consider how much effort and energy all parties kind of put into, you know, wanting K-State to land Grant Bricks. And it would have been nice to get, you know, Gus Hawkins then bumps himself into the space of being a four-star offensive lineman in a class that, I mean, we can we can start diving into it more individually speaking on certain guys, but offensive line was kind of the theme of this class for K-State. Um, what, what are they getting in this group that's coming in? Because obviously Gus Hawkins is probably the top guy. He was the first one. Uh, he's the guy that you know we saw early in the season in person, got to talk to and everything. He's probably number one on people's radars, but there are a lot of other guys in this class at offensive line that project out pretty good for K-State. Oh, yeah, it, it's, it was definitely an offensive line heavy class, and it, it makes sense if you look at where K-State's roster was this past year that they needed to supplement and bring in more young guys on the offensive line because even though they have Easton Kilty, uh, the transfer from North Dakota, it's hard to bring in transfer offensive linemen and play right away. And I'm not saying that any of these offensive linemen are going to play right away either, but you just need the numbers and need the depth. Uh, but Gus Hawkins, I, I actually wrote, I think it's in either the signature spotlight or uh, the signing day superlatives that I have for this entire K-State class. There's not many offensive linemen that move like Gus Hawkins does at his size. He's 6'7", 280. And I think that we'd both agree that that number is probably pretty accurate that what at what he's listed at and he can really move his feet he's a big time mauler too when he's on run blocks um i even said that i think that he's still a little underrated because i think he is that good moving and moving in space that i think that i put him as the guy that i think could be a potential nfl player uh in this entire class because if he hits his ceiling i think that he could be a very high nfl draft pick uh caden massey uh, the London offensive lineman is another one that I've seen in person, and he moves super well. And what impresses me the most about Massey is every time that I saw him, he continued to get better. Like I, as as a junior, he was still he was still good, but you saw the light kind of flash in between after the football season and like probably the start of his basketball season, where you could see, oh, like I, I really like where he is going and where he's trending. And then it really kind of came into fruition in the spring at uh, the UC Report Camp, uh, which is a camp that's in Kansas City, has all kinds of talent from the Midwest co- that came to it. Um, I think there was four and five star defensive linemen that were there and Caden Massey would go one on one with them and he held his own, which for what I thought of as a Massey at that point, I thought he was probably more of a project guy. And all offensive linemen are a project that in yeah. some way or another, but he's one that you could really see the light click on. And I, I'm just really impressed with how he continues to get better. And with Connor Riley as his position coach, you know that Connor Riley will probably get the best out of him. Ryan Howard is a guy that I think will be the, probably the first player off the bus because he is massive. Yeah. Like, will Howard's not so little brother. Yeah. The, it is not little brother when it comes to Ryan and Will. Uh, Ryan is just the younger brother because Ryan, I think, could could probably beat Will up if they were if they were to have like a one on one wrestling match. Uh, Ryan is a lot more of a mauler and a road grader, so he's probably more of an interior guy, and he would be a big interior player at six six, which isn't a bad thing. I mean. It, We've seen big offensive linemen and big defensive linemen, and it's 
kind of everybody has been saying like, when is K-State going to get that? When's K-State going to get that? Well, you add all of these guys and it, it looks like they're on that uh, trajectory. Um, Kyle Rockers is another guy that's probably an interior guy. What's interesting about uh, Howard and Rockers is that Kyle Rockers is most likely going to be a center for K-State. Real quick, I think for me and everybody else, you're blowing our minds. It that's pronounced rockers. Yes, that is actually pronounced rockers. That's good. That's a good note for everybody to have on signing um, day. It actually blew my mind the first time <laughs> that somebody said it. I think it was Connor Riley and I were talking about him. Okay, good because if you had said it was Chris Kleiman <laughs> said it, I would have I would have debated that because uh, we know that uh, that Chris Kleiman. I don't think he ever learned Nate Matlack's last name uh, in the time that he was here. Um, but yeah, it was, it was Connor Riley in, uh, actually it was, uh, Maddie Gage and Dylan Foster have all corrected me because at one point I told them all that it was Kyle Rakers and they're like, no, it's, it's Kyle Rockers. So Kyle Rockers is an interior guy, which is interesting because he's a center and you don't really see Casey go after scholarship centers. And what's doubly interesting with him being a center is that he's enrolling early so it'll be interesting to see how he develops because, I mean, you're missing a center. I'm not saying that he'll start as a true freshman, but it, getting on campus early and being a center when there's a, a hole on the roster is very interesting uh, to me, at least. And you don't see offensive linemen at K-State in a role early very often. But Rockers moves his feet pretty well as well. And this is just a big-time class by Connor Riley, who I think is one of the most underrated coaches uh, in the country when it comes to recruiting. And especially developing because I mean, uh, I hear that that Cooper BB guy is pretty good. Yes, very true. Uh, he is he is very good. Uh, another guy that should be mentioned here, and I know that there's been some discussion about where he'll play or not. Doesn't count towards the class because it's not as a scholarship. But Navarro Shunky is a guy that should be mentioned as well because that was a massive deal when K State was able to get him. Another guy that has four star status as an offensive lineman. Uh, but he committed as a PWO because K-State was still kind of playing this waiting game. And because of his background, he he ends up getting uh, his school paid for outside of an athletic scholarship. So tell us a little bit about Navarro Shunky. Yeah, this was an absolute thievery and highway robbery by K-State to get Navarro Shunky as a PWO. Um, it's not very often that you see a four-star get PWO status from a school. Um, but he is another guy that's probably more of an interior one that is a he's more of a mauler and road grader on the offensive lineman as well kind of like ryan howard is um and what is just so insane to me is that is him coming in as a pwo because he's a guy that i think could potentially play and play a big role at k-state which just adds to the legacy of k-state walk-ons and I know that we're, we won't get into this a ton because it's uh, the signing day class is more scholarship guys. Mm -hmm. But if you look at this PWO class that K-State's put together, it's probably one of the best ones that they've had. Well, we can get into it real quick because that that's the stuff that is important to a lot of people throughout the state and everything else. I mean, give it, give us some guys real quick on the PWO list outside of Shunky who a little bit of a different scenario because that's a guy that it's not like it was just K-State that had – power five offers out to him i mean he had legit schools like nebraska auburn tennessee ku illinois pitt arizona state all these teams interested in as a scholarship guy k-state got him as a pwo but some of the more traditional guys we think of as walk-ons who are some of the names to know for the cats uh so some of the the names to know pwo wise holden bass is a big one i i'm a big fan of his i loved him at the k-state offense and defensive line camp uh it was the same camp that actually had navarro shunky and uh gus hawkins and i th i thought that holden bass was one of the best players that was at the camp uh he's really impressive d tackle from nemaha central really knows how to use leverage well he's a really good wrestler i believe as well which I mean, that, that seems to be a, a trend as, with defensive linemen that do well at K-State. Uh, I believe his name is his name is pronounced Kion Payne, uh, defensive lineman from St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, which in, what's interesting about him is I believe he was a flip from North Dakota State 
uh, and is coming to K State on a power or a PWO, which you don't see that very often from guys that are committed to a high level FCS program. And I believe Payne had a power five offer from, I want to say Wisconsin at one point. And now he's going to be a PWO at K State. Uh, Bryce Nor Nornberg is another one from Olathe East. Uh, what's interesting about him, he is actually a quarterback in high school, but it will be moving to wide receiver at K State. And he's another one that's just really athletic. And you can see that he has all the tools to potentially be a player, kind of like Ty Bowman down the road, where you probably see him more um, on the uh, special teams aspect. Sorry, the you're everybody watching this will know who this is by now, but uh, K State is in the process of getting another commitment and we're trying to figure out who that is. Yeah, so if we look distracted while we're yes. recording this, that is what's happening. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll probably uh, end up we, we may have already said his name, so we'll uh, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit once uh, it yeah. all becomes I official. Say, and I, I think so. we've already said his name, but it, we can really dive into that once it's official. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, all right, so. Then let's let's keep going through this class right now because I would say after offensive linemen, the other theme of this class would be that K State was able to go out and get some wide receivers that appear to have some pretty good upside in Jaquez Bradley Demps and Trey Davis. Um, so tell me a little bit more about those two guys and what K State's getting there. So with Trey Davis, it's kind of like we talked about in the commitment video. You're getting a speed merchant. He's a player. I believe if he comes in and makes an impact right away, it will likely be in the return game uh, because he's the the troop high school school record holder in single single game single season and career return yards, as well as like I, I believe it's uh, receiving yards and um, receptions and touchdowns. Like Trey Davis kind of did it all at his high school, and I'm just really excited to see where he goes. Uh, once he gets to K-State, because he is on a, a little bit of the, the lighter side, but he's also a basketball player and runs track. Like we saw that with Sheedy Obi Iser, that he was a big time basketball player as well. And once he got to campus, he really bulked up. And now we're, we're going to see that a little bit with Trey Davis. Uh, Jaquez Bradley Demps is intriguing to me because he is kind of like more of a yards after catch kind of guy and a contested catch player. Uh, because he has massive hands and he's really built and he, he will probably be more of like an X and, or an outside receiver and one that, and a guy that you could probably throw the ball up to and he'll come down with it. But he's another one where he probably doesn't blow you away speed wise compared to Trey Davis, but he's shifty enough and uses his angles well enough to be kind of like a, a more yards after catch guy. I, I like that his nickname on Twitter is Debo because he is kind of a, a Debo ish kind of like Brandon Ayuk receiver where he gets the ball and you just let him run because he is kind of like a running back that plays wide receiver. I knew that you would like the, the Debo nickname. Yeah. Well, no, I, not get, no PTSD for I get uh, to see him Reiner. victimize the Cowboys quite a bit. So as long as as long as that translates to Big Twelve opponents being victimized by a Wildcat, it's uh, no big deal to me. Then I can I can live with the nickname, and I'll probably be referring to him as it. Uh, looking around, then we can flip to K State. Actually, you know, has two other skill position guys in this class. They added two running backs. One came all the way back. And he, it was either late March or early April uh, when they got John Price out of the Kansas City area. And then the most recent addition to the running back room, it didn't come until just last week. So uh, give us a little bit about the two running backs that are coming into the program, because as we kind of know now, K-State, the running back depth behind DJ Giddens, uh, it basically it just it. drops off hard to Joe Jackson, who's going to be a redshirt freshman next year. So uh, what do we need to know about these two uh, freshman running backs that will be coming in? Yeah, it's kind of like you said that uh, there is not a lot of depth behind uh, DJ Giddens right now. That's at least proven. So you would expect one of John Price or Devon Rice, which elite nickname potential with those two. <laughs> 
uh, to come in and potentially play a role right away. Um, John Price, their names are so similar. I have to say, I have to like really. Think that is about- true. I didn't even think about that, but yes, John Price and Devon Rice. That's uh, that's yeah. that's some tricky navigating there. Like I have to really think about which one before I say it out loud. Uh, but John Price is more of kind of like a one cut back, kind of similar to like a Le'Veon Bell ish running style where he will see the hole and then go through it. He probably won't wow you with speed, but he'll wow you with power. And he he is a very powerful runner and is not afraid to dish out blocks. I encourage people to go watch his film and just watch. You can watch the whole thing, but there's like three blocks, and especially in pass protection where he just destroys a linebacker coming in on a blitz. And I mean, we, we've seen it with DJ Giddens. And that's a, that's a valuable skill. I mean, that, that's a skill that will get you on the field early if you can master it at the college level. Um, but he is more of a patient. We'll see the hole and go in kind of a more of a one cut kind of style. Devon Rice is more of like a, I see the hole and I'm going to blow by you because I am faster than you. I think he ran like a four, four, six at the UC report camp when it was on in on the West coast. Um, he is from Bishop Gorman, which is one of the best high schools in the country. I believe Max preps named them the national champions this season, which makes sense because if you have a chance, go look at their roster. <laughs> Devon Rice did not start at Bishop Gorman because yeah. their their other running back was committed to Michigan. <laughs> yeah, no, they uh, <laughs> very much a loaded roster, and and that I mean, we kind of talked about it when we we did the the Rice video after he committed, but it it led to him being probably overlooked in some ways because he was committed to Hawaii. K-State came in, but they weren't the only power four schools, power five schools that came in there at the end of everything. So uh, this is probably a guy that if he's anywhere but Bishop Gorman and he's getting to be the featured guy in an offense, he's probably got some significant offers. You know, this isn't saying that he's, he should be a four or a five-star guy, but He's a guy that is worth more than what the profile of offers and probably the amount of tape that's out there would suggest. Yeah, if if he was at a different school where he was the number one running back, I, I will even venture to say he's probably ranked a little bit higher because he just didn't get the ball a ton. I think he only touched the ball 59 times, but also had 14 touchdowns. <laughs> that's, pretty good. A, that, that's a pretty good ratio. So... You what you see with him is he's patient, but Devon Rice, it doesn't take him quick or it doesn't take him long to get up to full speed. He will get the into the hole and attack it. And well, like I said, he'll just get around you because he's so much faster. I do think Devon Rice is probably more likely to see the field early. And in fact, uh in the signing day superlatives, um, because I wrote this in advance, not knowing kind of what the Malcolm Alcorn Crowder situation was going to look like. So I might go in and change this now, but I actually had Devon Rice as the guy that I think will see the field right away for K-State. Uh, it just makes sense. You see this at K-State a lot now with running backs where they come in and they can play as a true freshman. And Devon Rice is going to be a guy that's even more rare because he's going to enroll early. And like you, you didn't get that with Joe or and you didn't get that with Jacardia Wright. Deuce Vaughn didn't have a spring. So like you you see this and it's like it just think it just seems too perfect because there's not a lot of depth behind DJ Giddens that's proven and Rice is coming in right away. And it just it seems like the perfect fit of somebody that would play right away as a true freshman to me. All right. Well, we'll finish off talking about the offense with you know the the most important part uh of the offense. That would be the quarterback and K-State obviously last year got the guy that you anticipate being your starter for the next at least three seasons. Um, What should the expectation be for a guy like Blake Barnett uh, coming in just a class after Avery Johnson? And so everything from skill set, but also what it kind of means in terms of how do you keep a guy that obviously has some serious talent like Barnett that the buzz keeps getting louder for how do you keep him in a position where he's content possibly having to wait three years before he gets 
a crack at quarterback at K-State? So I'll, I'll try and tackle the first uh, part of, or the latter part of your question first. Um, I think that the way you keep him happy and it's kind of, it's not why Avery Johnson did not redshirt because he was just too good to not see the field, but your pitch to Barnett is look, Avery's going to be two classes ahead of you because he'll be a junior when you're a redshirt freshman. And if everything goes according to plan and how everybody wants it to go and, well, probably not the K-State coaches, but how the K-State fans and Avery yeah. Johnson wants it to go. Avery Johnson could leave after his junior season and go to the NFL. Yeah. So like you you kind of pitch to him, hey, look at what we have. And yes, you probably won't play a lot right now, but you could be the, the next guy as soon as your sophomore season, which the other thing too is, and people have to remember this, every other program has the same thing going on at quarterback where you have to, t you take one in every class, because if mm -hmm. you don't, you end up with Cody cook as your quarterback. Yeah, you get behind. You end up with Cody cook having to be your emergency quarterback. Um, so every school has to go about this the same way. And it'll be on the new quarterbacks coach to really keep Blake Barnett engaged and keep him in. But from a skill set, a skill set perspective I, I think that there is an avenue where blake barnett plays a little bit next season because i think he's too athletic to not see the field kind of like avery johnson was and if you want to take some hits and take some carries away from avery johnson you could give them to blake barnett who by the way might be as fast if not faster than avery johnson which is saying something yeah that's pretty crazy to think and because Blake Barnett rounds like a 10.6, a hundred meter dash, which is absurd for a quarterback and, a, and for somebody being six, three and like 215 pounds. Uh, the one thing that Barnett, you probably, what you don't get with him that you get with Avery Johnson is Barnett has good arm strength, but probably won't wow you in the same sense that Avery Johnson does but he can put the ball in tight windows. He's very accurate. He can throw on all kinds of platforms, which nowadays is a really important thing for a quarterback, which even five years ago, you're probably not saying that that's something that like, oh, you probably need to have this, but you probably need to have that now. Um, you're also getting an absolute warrior and gamer. I encourage everybody to try and find at least highlights of the Erie high school, uh, state championship game Blake Barnett could barely walk in the second half and he stayed in because his high school I don't think had won a state championship before and he wasn't going to let them not win it and he gutted out a performance to give Erie the state title and by the way Blake Barnett played defense in the state championship <laughs> game and and had a pick six in the state in a state title game so like it what you're getting is an absolute gamer and warrior and people will, it, it goes a certain way with some guys on if you like this or not, but Blake Barnett also comes with a lot of swagger. He, <laughs> he will let you know when he makes a big play. Well, uh, that that's probably, uh, uh, a fun thing for K-State fans if he ends up making plays for them and seeing uh, where things go from there. So uh, that's one that, I, you know, I think when it initially happened, people were like, okay, this feels like a pretty good pickup. But it only got better as the offseason and then his senior year progressed. And it's come to a point now where, as we mentioned, he's one of the guys that we're counting that he's got four-star status from at least one of the four services that ranks these guys. And uh, that's a big deal moving forward so it's, we'll see what that combo looks like with him and Avery Johnson I mean th those are two guys right there in your quarterback room right now that it, if everything goes to plan you're covered at quarterback over like the next six years now and you've got two dudes that are insane athletes from an athlete standpoint I don't think K-State has had a more athletic quarterback room than Avery Johnson Jacob Knuth and Blake Barnett uh, this is another sneak preview slash old news if you're depending on when you're listening to this but i i said that blake barnett was probably k-state's best recruiting win when you take into consideration everything like it, it would have been easy for blake barnett to be like nope i i want to open up my commitment 
Colin Klein yes. was my lead recruiter. Colin Klein was a Colorado guy. Colin Klein was my position coach in the future. And he didn't. And Chris Klein and Taylor Brett stepped up and stepped in. And I mean, that, those two really sealed the deal and kept K-State getting his signature. Yeah, I mean, what you go and look at his, his on three profile, one of the offers he had was from Washington. Uh, and you think mm-hmm. about how, how good Washington's been and what Kalen DeBoer does with quarterbacks. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good uh, sign of, of what you're getting there. All right, let's flip to the other side of the ball now because K-State has brought in a handful of defensive players in this class. You can go through and you can look uh, kind of at, at each level of the defense now is bringing somebody in. Uh, we'll start in state and a guy that they ended up getting to flip for Nebraska and Callan Barta. That was another one when it happened. I mean, came along pretty quick. It felt like, and in a matter of days, once there kind of started to be the noise that it was going to happen, he flipped from Nebraska to K state. So uh, what's the lowdown on the incoming safety from Topeka? Yeah. So Callan Barta is an interesting one because he's another one that the more that I saw he just can he continued to get better. Um, what's interesting about him as well is that he plays corner in high school, but will fl- be flipping to safety in college. And we've kind of seen that with uh, Josh Hayes, and we saw that from Marquis Siegel, and now we're going to see that at the high school level and how that translates. But Barta has very good cover skills and has good ball skills. The game that I was at, I think he had at least one interception and had a pass breakup. Uh, you're getting a hard-hitting safety as well. I mean, he he is not afraid to come up and put his nose in and lay you out. Um, it's another kind of a – I would consider this probably their second or third biggest recruiting win because Bart is a guy that Nebraska really wanted to keep. And K-State, it, it seemed like it happened in a hurry behind – or from, like, the perspective of, like, what we saw, like, offer, official visit, commit. But this was kind of a long time coming because he was on K-State's radar before. And when he went to the camp, K-State was hesitant about offering and they wanted to kind of wait and see. And then he goes to the Nebraska camp and Nebraska offers commits uh, like a week later, I think it was. But K-State really wanted him and they really turned up the heat again in like August and September. And then October, you finally saw kind of all the fruition or the work and the fruits of their labor kind of come together. And he committed uh, like probably two hours after he left Manhattan on his <laughs> official visit. Like it, it was, it was, he got home and was like, this is where I want to go. Um, and k is going to get a pretty productive player. I think he, he has a pretty high floor, I would say, because I think he's at least a guy that you can put. And I think that he would be a monster on special teams. Well, so another guy that K State was able to to kind of flip. Actually, a handful of guys uh, throughout this class were committed somewhere else at one point or another. We already talked about some offensively, defensively. Boone Morris is a guy at linebacker was originally committed to UTSA, um, and that's another one that happened in season that K State was able to make the switch. So, uh, what's the word on Boone Morris? Uh, Boone Morris is a guy. I feel like Chris Collinsworth right now. By the way, <laughs> yeah. Boone Morris is a guy that uh, I I think that he's probably a little bit underappreciated and underrated when it comes to rankings uh, because, and I say this because I was wrong last year when talking about the guy that I think he is the most similar to, where he is very similar to Austin Romaine. And I, I liked Austin Romaine, but I thought that he was probably more of like a project kind of guy. But I, I so I want to get out in front of this with Boone Morris because they're they play very similarly and are very were both very highly productive in high school. Boone Morris had like 430 tackles in his high school career, which is absolutely absurd to say. Yeah, um, he's a football junkie. He fits what K State wants to do. He, what's also interesting about him is how he got to K State. Uh, because he visited in the 2022 season uh, for the Tulane game and was a defensive lineman. And K-State kind of talked with him and said, 
hey, like if you move to linebacker, like we'll we'll like we'll probably offer you depending on what we, we see on the film. But if you're going to be a defensive lineman, like we don't know kind of where that will go. Well, Morris then goes back to Mount Vernon, Texas and switches to linebacker like midway through their season because he visited in September of 2022, flips to linebacker, was originally going to camp at K-State, but they just couldn't find a time where both of them were going to be on the same page and be able to go to the camp at the same time. And then Morris's high school season starts and K-State keeps turning up the heat and turning up the heat and then offers. And he actually got offered by Oklahoma State while he was in Manhattan and still ended up committing to K-State. So then you get all, it's kind of like you, what you get is a football junkie and gamer that really wants to be at K-State because K-State is the one that told him to move to linebacker. And, and it's crazy to see kind of how that story all ends up playing out. Yeah. So you, you get a guy like this in, and then defensively you add another guy in the secondary in Zayshon Rich. So this is a guy that, he was committed to Wyoming, and I think a lot of people, at least the ones that have been on K-State Online for a while now, they've probably seen the basketball highlights. This is a supreme athlete that's he getting, is that K-State's freak getting. athlete, yes. He, he, the, the highlights of him dunking are crazy. So uh, he is a big-time athlete, probably more of a project in college, Uh just because he's so raw right now, but the potential is there and he's long and tall like they like in all of their corners and fast. And like what, what I like about him is he's even more put together than the last time I saw him, which was the K-State camp in June, because he's another one like Callan Barta where K-State saw him, but didn't offer right away and wanted to see a little bit more. And when they saw a little bit more, they ended up offering him. And then he took his official visit in the snow, which for a Minnesota guy. Probably yeah, he, he was probably, probably one too. of the few guys that was ever worried about that situation. He's like, yeah, okay, whatever. A Minnesota guy that was committed to Wyoming. The snow probably didn't bother him at all. Uh, but he ends up taking the official visit and then committing, I think it was almost a week later. Um. And he's, he's one where, and I say this about all defensive backs in high school, it's so hard to get a really impressive tape yep. because nobody's throwing it at you. So a lot of his tape is on the offensive side of the ball, which is fun to watch because he is, he is very, very fast and just blows by everybody. But uh, I'm really interested to see where uh, Rich's potential goes because if he reaches his ceiling, he could be another guy that is very, very good because of his length. And he has a bunch of things that um, you just can't teach for a defensive back. All right. Last guy defensively uh, that, that we know of at the moment. Uh, we can we can do a little <laughs> bit more hinting later. Uh, is a guy that he was one of the earlier commits, commits of the class all the way back in March. Uh, I think this one happened. I was... Uh, I think I was sitting at my wife's grandparents' house and, you know, was not anticipating uh, a commitment to come in. And then, of course, you know, it does. So I think I was writing a story on my phone. Uh, what should we know about Jake Stonebreaker, another guy that has four-star status, depending on the service you're looking at, and uh, a guy that, I, you know, depending on who you kind of listen to and see, uh, there are some people that are really high on him and could make the argument that he might be the best uh prospect in the state of Colorado for 2024. Yeah, first off, elite name for linebacker. Yes. yes. Stone breaker. Um, but he his comp is probably uh, one that's been floated out to me from people inside of veneer complex is Austin Moore. Which if you would get Austin Moore's production out of anybody, I think you're doing something right. And um He's probably more of a, a will linebacker, kind of like Austin Moore. And Jake Stonebreaker's not afraid to hit and hit hard. He, I actually put, he is uh, the person that I put as the fan favorite for 
uh, the K-State signing day superlatives because I, I think he's a dude that will hit hard. And he's kind of like Blake Barnett where he's not afraid to talk trash after he makes a big play. And he will get right up in there. And for a linebacker, I think that's an impressive trait to have and what would make him a fan favorite. Uh, kind of like with Barda and uh, Zashawn Rich, high school is just so hard at some for some levels at especially when you're on the defensive side of the ball because you're probably such a supreme athlete that your head coach wants you to play offense and, and so jake stonebreaker actually plays running back for his high school too and he has a lot of good highlights running the ball uh what impresses me the most about uh jake stonebreaker is you'll see on his tape that he has a very quick first step when he's rushing the quarterback there was one play where I think the they were running. It was a slower developing handoff, but Stonebreaker almost took the handoff from the quarterback. So he he's very good at getting to the quarterback and getting to the quarterback in a hurry. Um, what also just excites me about him is he is another guy that, again, when you're compared to Austin Moore, it's a good thing because he is the machine, as we all know at this point. Uh, where if you look at a lot of Jake Stonebreaker's social media and everything, he is always working and always working on his craft, pass rush moves, coverage moves. You always see him working out in a gym somewhere and just trying to get better. And K-State has a type. I mean, that that's why they've had so much so much success the past two seasons and under Chris Kleiman just in general. They, they find guys that love football and are big-time gamers. So that is the 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 list of guys that uh, are currently committed as of you know Tuesday afternoon that we're talking about. Uh, if K State were to get the commitment uh, that we mentioned earlier from a guy like Malcolm Alcorn Crowder, uh, if that is to happen, uh, what what would be the outcome there, and how big of a deal would that be for K State to get uh, one of the 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 better JUCO players out there and from Butler? Uh, so what you're getting, what you'd be getting with Malcolm Alcorn Crowder would be another heavier defensive end. I know that we've seen kind of this transformation of what K State wants from the defensive ends, and, and I wonder if you ask somebody about it, if it would come from what Texas and what Iowa State was able to do to K State's defense this past season, where K State wants to get back to having a heavier defensive end. And we're, we're seeing that with Javon Banks moving to the defensive end. We saw that with Travis Bates, the transfer from Austin P. You'll probably see that, and you'll see that from Malcolm Alcorn Crowder uh, from Butler uh, Community College, if you were to commit to K-State, where you want a heavier defensive end on one side because you don't have three down linemen. So you have your nose guard, a heavier defensive end, and then probably more of like a speed rush kind of guy at the other defensive end. Because you kind of saw K-State struggle with teams that have a heavier offensive line. Uh, and it's it's a blessing and a curse to go to this 3-3-5 because you are good at stopping the spread. And you see the spread offense all the time in college now. And K-State's defense has been really good since they moved to the 3-3-5. But where you get into trouble sometimes is when it comes to teams with a big offensive line. And if you can combat that with having a pretty big defensive line and still not lose anything athletically, then you need to do it. And we're seeing that right now at K-State. And it's, it, I mean, the, it's why we're seeing more heavy and probably more experienced defensive linemen. And it wouldn't, it honestly wouldn't surprise me if out, there's times next year, if K-State were to get Malcolm or Alcorn Crowder, because I mean, it's still not officially out there yet. Mm-hmm that on a pass rush situation that he's the one that probably moves to nose guard uh, with like Travis Bates at one defensive end and maybe somebody like Brendan Mott at the other, because that just provides a lot more power than K-State probably had at defensive end or on the entire defensive line all this, this past season. All right. We have gone over the guys in the class, everything else that goes into that. And obviously uh, if anything different changes, we'll have some amendments out uh, Wednesday night and everything else. Uh, let's go over one other thing. 
and dive into that now and take a look at some of the overall numbers of the class. So what you can see here is the current Big 12 class ranking for 2024. Uh, this is your standard. Here is a look at the, you know, just the the score that they come up with. It's a different combination. It's a mix of how many commits you have, and then obviously the talent that they're bringing in. Texas Tech at the top of the class. Look, there's there's really no doubt that Texas Tech should probably be number one. They've had a phenomenal year recruiting with Joey McGuire. They've got six guys that are four or five stars. One of which is a five star. Um, they're one of the tops in the class. Then UCF, TCU shortly behind them. UCF taking full advantage of being in Florida uh, with six four-star guys committed there. And then Colorado, only nine commits uh, in the 2024 class, but they have the best rating out of the class in terms of what they're bringing in with their five-star and three-star talent uh, that Deion Sanders has put together. And then KU number five, uh, taking 16 uh, this year into their their high school slash JUCO class, which is more than what Lance Leipold had been doing. Um, in terms of what we're looking at here with the Big 12 overall, because you can scroll down and see that K-State's at 11th. We already kind of explained this a little bit. Big picture, what does this mean for K-State and in terms of the rest of the Big 12? What are some takeaways? I, in general for K-State, I think you want to keep up the – momentum that you have currently i mean the, the past two classes are probably the two best classes k-state's had in recent memory in terms of class average i mean you, you've taken a jump up in class average again this year which is impressive and you want to keep that up moving forward uh, when you have more spots to fill uh some in general big 12 takeaways as long as joey mcguire is going to be at texas tech I think they might be the best team in terms of uh, Big 12 high school recruiting because he has so much or has so many connections in the state of Texas. I know at one point, I don't know if it's still true, but there was definitely a point in the summer where they had like 20 commits and all of them were from the state of Texas, which is just absolutely insane to me. Uh, UCF is another school that will be uh, pretty close to the top every year, I, I believe. Um, it, and it's it is a product of playing in Florida and now playing at the Power Five level. It'll be interesting to me to see how UCF's recruiting goes next year. With I mean, you have a little bit less questions with Gus Malzahn uh, with him getting an extension, but I'm still not totally sold on malls on as the answer at ucf what will also be interesting to me is to see how their recruiting goes if they were to beat florida next season mm -hmm. if the recruiting was to take off even further but they're obviously going to be a team to watch it's also interesting to me to see ku's class uh rank so highly and i mean there there are some really good KU commits in this class. Uh, I believe it's Deshaun Warner that blew up even further and was offered by Ohio State in the middle of the season and is still uh, with Kansas. And, and it's a product of they have a lot of spots available. But I think you're also seeing them build on the success. That, we, uh, yeah. Are you laughing at our third commentator today? She is uh, she, having the time of her life on the floor down here. Uh, she is so either apologies. She is either excited or or is trying to boo this KU recruiting class. Oh, uh, they do they do sound a lot like boos, so we'll just <laughs> take it that way that uh, she's booing down there. She doesn't want us to to talk about it. But you're right. I mean, look, this the, you, we can try and, and talk it down, and a lot of people you can probably find ways to poke holes in KU's class. You can find ways to poke holes in anybody's recruiting class, but. It's impressive what Lance Leipold has done, and I guess the question that everybody is probably wondering is how worried should they be about what Kansas is doing and, and what they had happen this year in their recruiting cycle? That That's the million-dollar question to me and what is interesting going forward because it you see two completely different recruiting styles between the two in-state schools where – Kansas, I don't believe, has a single uh, Kansas commit 
in this class where K-State did most of their work in-state and did most of their work in-state last season or in the last recruiting cycle. So it'll be interesting to see how that kind of tracks going forward because K-State still has the advantage in-state. And I feel like it's a lot easier at a place like K-State or KU to have success if you're recruiting well in, in your own state. So we'll see how that goes. The other thing about the KU class that I think is probably the most impressive uh, for them is that their defense has had all kinds of problems in Lance Leifold's tenure so far. And it is impressive that they're, I think it's, is it their top four uh, commits are all, all, or top five are all on the defensive yeah. side of the ball. Yeah, top five are all def defensive guys. You've got two edge guys, two safeties, and a corner. Uh, in that mix there. So yeah, the, the, the defensive side has been a, a significant deal for him. And uh, we, we can officially say that Malcolm Alcorn Crowder is a Kansas state wildcat. Okay. He, there you he go. Has officially announced his commitment and I believe he will sign tomorrow or I guess today as you're. <laughs> yeah. It depends on when you're listening yeah. watching this uh, because he is a December graduate. So that that's a big time addition for K-State. All right. Well, good to good to know there, uh, and officially get him on board. And uh, in terms of what Case it was able to do and went out there, uh, this was a guy that I mean, he had a ton of offers from oh, all wow. over the place. Um, look, he, you can kind of go through and, and pick it out. He had an offer from UMass. He's a he's a Massachusetts native, uh, but you look around: Miami, Florida, USC, South Carolina, Mississippi State, NC State, Minnesota, Cincinnati. Uh, Houston, all power uh, four teams that had offers out to Malcolm Alcorn Crowder, and he chose the Wildcats. And and you already talked about kind of how he fits in, but that's a that's a that's a good get for them. Florida wanted him very badly. If yes, you, if I... you if you want like a who this, it's probably more of a head to head win over Syracuse because I believe he visited there uh, this past weekend. But it is Florida wanted him desperately. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, you could pick that up if, you know, you, you see what was going on with uh, our our good friends at the, the Florida on three <laughs> site. Um, he uh, he there were stories left and right about him visiting and them looking at him uh, that you could kind of tell that there was some desperation and some want for that. And uh, K-State was able to win out there. So that's a that's a big deal for them. All right. Let's go back to the overall status of the big 12 and we'll we'll shift this into a different scope and, and and explain to people kind of what we were talking about earlier first of all let's point out iowa state they have 22 commits in the class um uh, that puts them at the top with tcu texas tech and cincinnati for the most in the class yet no matter how you slice it they are in the bottom portion of the league they are 13th in terms of the overall rating that's given out. And then when you give like the actual average rating of the players, they're 15th. The only team that's worse than them is Houston. So uh, explain to us maybe before we even dive into this average rating stuff, uh, what this might mean for Iowa State and Matt Campbell. Uh, what that means is that you're kind of seeing a little bit of potential like the Matt Campbell shine might have worn off a little bit on the recruiting trail. I, I know that part of the reason that the, this class probably struggled to get off the ground for them had to deal with the gambling scandal and not knowing what Iowa State was going to look like. And then there was a point where Iowa State uh, lost to Ohio in the non-conference. But, I mean, it, Iowa State is a lot like K-State in terms of developing and getting guys that are probably underrated, under-recruited, and turning them into big-time players. So it, it, it's one where when you don't know a ton off the rip, you kind of chalk it up to Matt Campbell knows a, a pretty good amount, I would say. But it, it, that is interesting because Houston's class would probably be better if they weren't going through a coaching change. So it is interesting to kind of see that Iowa State would be last and score and average if if Houston wasn't having to scramble right now because I, I don't envy schools that have to make a coaching change right now with how the recruiting calendar is all sped up. All right. So in terms of the average rating, this is where K-State kind of comes into play where they're seventh 
in terms of how everything is currently constructed. Now, keep in mind, you already mentioned that this does not include an update to Jaquez Spradley Demp's rating on Rivals, which he's gone from a, a 5.42 star to a 5.63 star, uh, which is that's a pretty significant bump when you consider it's not just going from a two star to a three star, but it's he skipped over that baseline three star range that Rivals uses. And this doesn't include Malcolm Alcorn Crowder yet, who is a pretty well thought of three star that adds in the mix. So K State's average rating probably is better than what we're showing you right now as the seven spot on here. So give us a little breakdown in terms of what you think K State stacks up as with the rest of the Big 12. Uh, so what, what you're seeing is K-State's recruiting profile is going up, and it, it was going up last season. You're seeing that continue this season, that they're kind of taking a jump, and it's kind of like Jerome Tang has talked about with the basketball staff where they're getting into more living rooms and getting uh, more guys that you probably didn't expect them to before, but you're seeing that kind of take off on the football side. And it, this is... Uh, I think uh, what everybody will kind of see is the overall ranking and probably not be so thrilled about this class because last year's class was so historically high. But this is a class where this is about all you could ask for for the amount of spots that they had coming in. And if they're top five in average, despite their class being so highly ranked last year, I think they were still only like 10th in the Big 12 in average last yeah. season. So like if they can get consistently in the top five or I mean, with how this staff develops, even the top half of the Big 12, you would expect them to really thrive uh, on the field as well. Yeah, that's the, the thing. And uh, that's why the reason I tell people this, I'll try and find what what to look at overall you look at where K-State would stack up in terms of like nationally overall, it doesn't look good. So if you look at the just, you know, generic numbers that everybody kind of looks at, that's probably where people would freak out a little bit because, you know, we get down to 50, you still have to kind of keep going down the list and everything else. And there's K-State at 58 currently. And again, there's a lot that has to be updated still with this. But I think that's why it's good to put into context and why a lot of people would remind you that, hey, you got to think about, the situation with the way these rankings are kind of made where sometimes numbers boost you ahead of people that have more quality. And I've tried to remind people this pretty much for the last year now, like this is a small class, so don't freak out about it. I mean, RIP my guy, Alec Bussy, but he kept being like, what's, what's going on with K state? Like, why do they have so few guys? Like that's by design. They took 27 guys in their class last year. That's a lot. That they is were due to have a smaller number this year. And it's also just so hard for all of those numbers because they, they can be just so misleading. Um, and it's – there's no great way to do recruiting rankings. I mean, I I say this as the, the K-State recruiting uh, guy yeah. uh, at KSO, that there's no great way to do it because in, in, a, in a sense, Bill Snyder was right when he said, go ahead and like rank these class, rank our class like four years from now. Um, but there's just no great way to know because you, you just, you never know. But yeah, I, well, real quick on that, like that's, that's a good point too, because like it, we all like to kind of make fun of Bill at the end for the recruiting style but ultimately the philosophy in terms of how he viewed some things recruiting, like that never will go out of style. That still is a legitimate thing. Like what you're saying where it's like, yeah, graded at the end. And that's kind of thing. Like, even if you grade K-State now fairly, this isn't a, a disastrous type of class or anything by any means, but at the end of this, things could work out a lot better. I mean, think about the, the class of 2020 that K-State brought in and how that thing would look now versus when it originally happened. I mean, I think it'd be funny to go back and look to see at some of the things that, that all of us said when that class was signed and what happened there, because I'm sure you can find things that, you know, who knows, maybe D.Y. was right all along. He probably was. Uh, I, I can't imagine some of the things that we probably said on the game 
during that time period when that class got signed. Um, so that would be kind of funny to go back and look at, but it, it's significant uh, what K-State was able to do here. And uh, they, they had a plan. They stuck to it. They didn't seem to panic in this process, and that's a big deal too. Yeah, I mean, you really got to see what – I think this is a class, probably not size-wise, that's ideal for what K-State would want it to do and what fans would want K-State to do ideally. But like average-wise, this is what fans have kind of wanted. They want K-State to be routinely in the top half of the Big 12. And heck, they might even be in the top five when it's all said and done. Yeah, that's uh, very true. All right, last thing we'll do uh, before my daughter drives me completely insane trying to do this. <laughs> Uh, I, I hate, again, I said this with D.Y., I hate being Steve Prome and <laughs> bringing my human shields up to the podium uh, after games. It's like, okay, Steve, you just lost in Bramlage Coliseum 47 to 35. Why are you bringing your kids to the podium? Um, <laughs> so I hate that I'm having to do this because I feel like a hack. And she's in her grabbing face, so she's grabbing me, she's grabbing the mic. What a disaster. <laughs> uh, here is a look at the state of Kansas rankings. As we know it, heading into signing day, Gus Hawkins at the top of the class, according to On3, as a four-star. Um, are you shocked in any way? Because, look, there are a couple of ways you can look at this. You can look at the On3 industry, or you can look at the On3. I've flashed up our On3. Hawkins, number one. Gavin Hoffman, who's committed to Iowa as a tight end, so he'll probably be in the NFL making millions of dollars in four years uh, doing crazy things because that's just <laughs> what Iowa tight ends do. Uh, are you surprised at all the way that the Kansas, the state of Kansas rankings kind of sorted themselves out at the end here? Um, I'm a little surprised that Caden Massey didn't get another bump. Um, I've said this when he was a uh, K-State target, and I'll say it again, that Michael Boganowski should probably be a four-star as well. Um, but it, it's interesting to see in the on-three industry rankings that Gavin Hoffman is now the number one player in the state of Kansas, and I believe it's Gus Hawkins as number two. Yes. Um, so that that's very interesting to me um, because, I mean, all along, I think it was kind of everybody thought it was going to be either Boganowski or Hawkins would be uh, the top two. But Gavin Hoffman is very, very good. Um, K-State just didn't offer Hoffman because they, they didn't take a tight end in this class and knew that they weren't going to take a tight end in this class. Uh, but it, it is interesting. Well, real quick on that, does that feel like a mistake if you have a guy – that talented locally and look, I, I get it numbers wise and everything else. And it may not have worked out for him in the end, but, but should K-State have been more active with that one? Would that be maybe the only regret of this recruiting cycle? It, it kind of goes both ways though, because you take Gavin Hoffman in this class and you probably can't get Desan Bram and Lincoln Cure in the 2025 class. That's true. Long game. Yeah. Suck so the hot guys. So, like, long-term, I don't think it, it's that big of a deal. And I do really like Gavin Hoffman as a prospect. And Iowa could not be a more perfect fit for a yeah. tight end. Um, So, I, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's a huge deal for K-State long-term. Um, it's, it's interesting to, for me to see that uh, Kellen Barta is still ranked a little bit lower in the industry ranking. I expected him to be a little bit higher uh, because I thought that he had a strong senior season. Um, the other thing that's uh, noteworthy to me is that this class was perceived to be a little bit worse in the state of Kansas than normal, or I guess not normal, but the last like few. Yeah, compared but, to the last few. But it's good to see that the state of Kansas, again, has multiple four stars. Michael Boganowski was very, very close to being a four star. So it, it it's always nice to see uh, more Kansas kids get a lot of national pub because it, it, it's good for the state when you see highly ranked players in the state. Yeah, and you go through and look in terms of the top 10 in Kansas, uh, K-State's able to deliver four of them. You mentioned earlier, KU didn't take a single in-state kid this year. Um, and, and again, that kind of goes into the success that they've had. So uh, in terms of just an overall grade to the 2024 class for K-State, this will be the last thing we do. What would you give it 
letter grade wise in terms of everything. So the talent that they've accumulated, the success they had in landing guys that they wanted and any other way you want to sum up this class, uh, where would you rank this uh, class of, of K state this year? I, I think I would grade this out at probably a B plus. You got a lot of good in this class. And I wrote about in the, the biggest miss section of the superlatives that K state didn't really miss a lot in this class. To, to be honest, if you took an official visit, you were, you were likely going to commit to K state is kind of how it played out. And we've seen that now with Malcolm Alcorn Crowder that in the eight official visits that we have confirmed at KSO, K-State's landed five of them and one is still on the table. So they could have gone six for eight in the last two weeks, which is an insanely high hit rate recruiting. Mm -hmm. Um, But you still have some holes on the roster. Nose guard is a massive position of need and you didn't take a high school guy you missed out on the juco defensive tackle tongo tonga lalohia you probably could have taken another corner at a juco or a high school rank um so it, it's probably a b plus because i mean you also missed out on uh grant bricks and michael boganowski who you put yeah. a lot of effort into and I will add this, like it felt like a late charge was made where Jay Sean Ross out of the Kansas yeah. City area seemed like, and then you know Nick Saban had to come in and ruin it for everybody. Yeah, and then and I think all three of Bricks, Boganowski, and Ross would all be in the top pro- they would probably make up the top three of the top four of the K State commits currently or signees, I guess, at this point. Um, so you missed out on those three, uh, plus Lalo Hia, which was just a, a big positional need. So I probably can't give you an A, a for that, mm-hmm. but they still did very, very well. And I mean, you, you look at the class and I, again, I say like the class average is as high as I've seen it at K state. So it, they, they did well on that front, but, and you, you're not going to be perfect recruiting, but you would have liked to see at least one defensive tackle taken in the early signing period. And I think that's going to be the one like really big miss by K state. Yeah. All right. Well, that will do it for signing day, 2024, the cats deliver. Uh, They'll still be looking for guys in the portal though, to kind of complete everything, get this roster totally filled out, but pretty productive class, even despite the smaller size, and uh, there's a lot more to hash into, so make sure to go check out all the signature spotlights over on KSO and uh, stay locked into kstateonline.com, whether if it's at On3 or here with the YouTube. I don't know what she just did to make herself mad. Uh, that was not a that was not a dad error. That was a her thing. So, boy, this is a disastrous end. The last 20 minutes have sucked for everybody, myself included. I'm sorry. For Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Both. Seriously, thank you for watching K-State Online if you put up with this today. Uh, You guys are the best, and we'll be back later in the week.